Welcome, welcome everyone. This is a special edition of the Benjamin Dixon Show. It will be hosted by uh, Nick and Kelly. We're going to be introducing and interviewing John Perkins, the author of The New Confessions of an Economic Hitman. So I'm very, very glad to have John on the show. How are you doing, John? I'm doing great, Nick. Thanks very much. Uh, it's great to be with you guys. Yeah, you know, John, I was telling you before, outside of uh, actually outside of the actual cast itself, that uh, you know, basically, I had seen you multiple times on um, Democracy Now, and I, I think the first time I heard it, you know, sometimes the first time you're exposed to something, you don't really absorb it. But then the second time, I had already read another book by Stephen Mincer called Overthrow, and it put everything in your book into a whole new perspective. So, you know, your book is The New Confessions of an Economic Hitman. Back then, this book wasn't out. It was just Confessions of an Economic Hitman. Now you've added another section that's talking about stuff that's more current and almost and a lot of stuff that's actually domestic. But um, both books are absolutely great books, and um, I would like to take this time, you know, just outside of the books to go ahead and have you uh, introduce yourself to our audience. I know I've talked about those two books, but Let's go ahead and do that first. Well, thanks, Nick. I guess that's uh, that's a pretty good introduction. I was a an economic hitman. Uh, this is back in the '70s. My official title was chief economist at a major Boston-based consulting firm, and uh, my job was to uh, identify countries that had resources our corporations want, like oil, for example, and then arrange a huge loan to those countries from one of the big banks like the World Bank or one of its sister organizations and that money would actually go to pay our own corporations Bechtel, Halliburton, Brown and Root, Stone and Webster, familiar names, most many of us to build big infrastructure projects in those countries and make huge profits in the process I might add uh, those pro the projects they built, power plants, industrial parks, things like that would help a few wealthy families in the country, the families that own the industries, the commercial centers but most everybody else would suffer as a result because money would be diverted from education, healthcare, and other social services to try to pay off the interest on the debt. And in the end, the principal would never be paid off. And so at some point, we go back and say, since you can't pay your debts, sell your resource, oil, whatever, real cheap to our corporations without any environmental or social regulations. Privatize. Sell off your utilities, your electric systems, your water and sewage systems, your schools, your prisons, your banks, everything like that to our own corporations. Uh, and uh, in the few cases where we failed, where leaders of countries didn't accept these deals, uh, people we called jackals, CIA assets would go in and either overthrow or assassinate those presidents. And uh, unfortunately, Nick, I, I two of my clients, uh, Jaime Roldos, president of Ecuador, and Omar Torrijos of Panama, I didn't play the game. I, I couldn't convince them to play the game, and so and they were both assassinated. And, and I just mentioned that the reason I wrote this new confessions 12 years after the last one was published is because really that system that we developed and used in the, in the de developing countries has come home to roost now in the United States, Europe, and the rest of the world. And, it's really, we've, been, we've all been hit, and we know that the system today is a global failure. We know that the economic system we've built is causing the oceans to rise and glaciers to melt, and it great tremendous inequality of, of resources and income around the planet. So we have to change it, and that's, that's really why I wrote the book, to, to help strategize a change. So let's talk about, you know, the term. You're going to use the term EHM. You're going to use the term the jackal and the military. And, uh, I guess the third wing would be the actual military itself. So you, as an economic hitman, you would go and be introduced to these leaders, and, and what was your primary goal in convincing them to, to actually take on the burdens of the loans? Well, really, when you come right down to it, we were building an empire, in, and, and, and we did. It was successful. It's probably the first truly global empire in history, and it's been built primarily without the military, although in, in recent years the military stepped back in in a big way. But we built it primarily through debt. And it's not a, a, a national empire for the first time in history. It's, it's not an American empire, really. It's a corporate empire. The American government pretty much stands behind it, the Pentagon, the CIA, uh, people like me and my old job stand behind it. But it's really a corporate empire. It's run by big corporations. And, and that is both a problem and it also it gives us the 
answer to how, how do we solve this because corporations are, are fairly malleable. We, we the people ultimately have a lot of control over corporations if we will just choose to exercise that control. Uh, that that's an, that is a very very interesting thought that us as individuals have the ability to actually try to shape the the what actually goes on with with the corporations. Is it what what exactly what kind of mechanism do you feel that the populace has to actually exert control over this? Well, I I think it's important for us to recognize that uh, corporations totally depend on us to buy their goods and services, uh, to work for them, to run them to invest in them, to support them through our tax dollars. Uh, you know, there's really um, two realities in the world, really, the t two main types of reality. There's what we might call objective reality. And these computers and TV screens and the earphones that you're wearing and the microphones we're talking to, those are objective reality. But bigger than that is the perceived reality. And we human beings are hugely influenced by perceived reality. And Basically, all of our institutions are perceived realities. Cultures are perceived realities. Um, corporations are perceived realities. Countries are perceived realities. So corporations are just these perceived realities that then are codified into laws and follow a set of principles. And But because they're, they're perceived realities that then impact the objective reality, we can change the perceptions. And... I can get into this in more detail, but the perception of what a good corporation was when I was in business school in the late 60s changed radically in the 1970s, and that changed everything. It created a failed global economy, what happened in the 1970s. Now we, can, we need to re-change that perception, that perceived reality. We need to transform it into a new perceived reality. I, 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 actually, I actually really do understand that. Now, to, to go back, not that we're going to actually come back to this because this is going to tie in, but when you read the books, what is it that you want the actual reader to, um, to actually take from this? Is it more they want, you want them to understand and knowing is half the battle that this is what it is? Is it more like a, a chance to shock or inform the populace about what actually goes on or – is there a greater lesson that you would like for us to, to, to actually get from it? Because when people read a book like this, the first thing they're going to want to do out of hand is reject it because the reality is so ugly. You know, and I think Ben has talked about this before. But just going back to the book, what, what, what would you like for the book to actually accomplish in terms of to the listeners or, or the readers? Well, thanks for asking that question, um, Nick. It's a... You know, I think the first book, mainly I, I wanted to get it off my chest. I wanted to get it out there. I had been to Ground Zero right after 9-11. I was in the Amazon on 9-11, went to Ground Zero. And I was so taken by what happened there and, and, and by the fact that our government was reacting in such a weird way by uh, saying we ought to go shopping, we ought to go attack uh, Iraq. And even then, most everybody figured out that Iraq probably wasn't the problem. Um, and, and so... I, I stood there ground zero, it was still smoldering, and I decided I, I just had to get the story out. Um, primarily to explain the way this system works, because I think it's, I, I'm a very loyal American. My family goes back to the, before the American Revolution, fought in the American Revolution, and every major war since. And I think it's a terrible shame that we've taken this course that's created so much animosity in the world, and has, We've taken a leadership role in creating this economy that I, I call a failed economy. Or I really call it a death economy. Mm -hmm. So it's time for us to understand that and then turn it around and create something I call a life economy. So that the, but the first book was really written to expose that system so that people would understand it. The, the New Confessions of an Economic Hitman, which just came out within the last couple of months, 12 years later, really updates it and, and incidentally, Readers often, people often ask me, should I, do I have to read the first one before I read the second one? And the answer is absolutely no. Just buy the second one. It's, it's got all the main stuff in it. But it's got this whole new section, including 15 chapters of a strategy for change, lists of things that we can do, strategies of things every one of your listeners can do, whether, whether your listener is a, a, a teacher or a social worker, an artist, a plumber, a carpenter, a parent, what, whatever. It's something we all can do to turn this around. You know, we, we, need, to tr we need to create an economic system that's a, that, that supports a life economy, that supports 
a, a an economy that's truly a renewable resource. We're on the road to doing that. We've already begun it. We're headed down that road, but we have to move down that road a lot faster. Okay, and I think that is very, very important. That's kind of what I felt when I read the book. I know you talk about your own internal conflict and your own experience kind of moving through the book, but I felt like between the first one and the second one, I read both of them, and you know, the second one has the first one in it, so more or less, and then it adds a new section. But I kind of felt that that was really what was in there, that you wanted us to kind of understand what is going on and then be able to look at strategies that have worked from other people as well as strategies that, that you've seen to kind of start pushing us in the right direction or at least to give us some tools that, by which we can begin to resist because so far – you know, we really haven't started that resistance, so to speak. If you could talk about uh, the brick makers and the RICO scenario, I think that sticks out as one of the one of the times you had people, you know, kind of standing up. If you could go ahead and elaborate on that, or just kind of give a brief synopsis and what was important about it. Wow. Well, that's a yeah, it's a very old story. It's when I was in the Peace Corps in, in Ecuador, and uh, I spent the first couple of years in the Peace Corps in the Amazon rainforest with indigenous people there. And then I was moved up into the Andes for the last year, the third year, to work with the Brickmakers Co-op to help them organize themselves into a marketing co-op so that they didn't get screwed by middlemen uh, who sold, them, who bought the bricks very cheap from them and sold them much more expensively to construction companies. And uh, they, they were, uh, as they formed a co-op, and, and they were resisting some of this, and, and one of them had gone to the mayor of the city and complained, and uh, shortly after that, uh, was killed, run, hit by a, by a truck. It was pretty obvious to most people that it wasn't an accident, and the community was scared, and they were willing to do just about anything um, not to let that happen again. And they they really were were giving in, and I I persuaded them that that you know it wasn't the authorities that were going to be able to help them, that they had to stand up for their own rights. It was really important that they take matters into their hands and understand that they had a right to change and I get deeply involved in that and it worked for them um, and it usually works for people and, and so that's a it's an example of where we are today you know I think this this time of this presidential election is very important because it, it's te- it, we, we have to recognize that no matter who the president the next president is he or she will not have a lot of power it's, it's very limited and this is a democracy, and in a democracy, we the people are supposed to have the power. The problem has been that with the election laws the way they are, where big money is so important, and where we're, we're even a candidate, let's say Bernie Sanders wins, let's, it doesn't take any money from any big corporations. He's still going to be surrounded by members of Congress, the Senate, lobbyists that have, have tremendous connections to big corporations, and they will call the shots. And we need to understand that and not put, not expect our presidents to work miracles, uh, but to understand that we're the ones who have to do it. So whoever your your candidate is, I'd encourage you, whoever, you to think about what is it that appeals to you about your candidate? What are the big issues that most appeal to you? And if your candidate gets elected, just push hard for those issues. Don't expect the candidate to do it alone. You go out and use social media. Social media is so powerful. Use everything you've got to push that issue. If your candidate doesn't get elected, don't just give in. Uh, push the issue anyway. Use social media. Start the consumer movement. Start political movements. There's so much we as, as individuals can do. And in a way, we've really allowed uh, big money and powerful interests to usurp our democracy. Uh, they've they they have they have been very clever. They've used the media in very clever ways, but we've allowed it also. We've had, there's been a lot of lethargy. And we and, 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 and just saying, well, geez, if just so and so gets elected, if just Obama gets elected, if just so and so gets elected, everything will be fine. Well, it doesn't work that way. And we need to understand that. Let me let me take it back. There was there was two things I want to pull out about that that brick story. So number one, we have people who are inside of the transaction or inside of the economy, so to speak, and their only purpose is to act as a middleman, and their only purpose is to extract money from the transaction but not actually add any value to the product. They didn't 
actually add anything to the brick. All they did was transport the brick or maybe not even transport the brick, just serve as like a connection maker between the people who actually made the bricks and the people who are buying them. And I think it's important that we understand that, you know, that is a model that exists throughout our economy. And, you, you know, you said it was a failed economy. And part of the reason is there's a lot of people there that are middlemen and they're just usurping. But what I liked about what you said was that how they ruled through fear and only through solidarity and working together could they actually overcome and create what's, what they made was a co-op that's, you know, barely successful and it worked out for them. So I, I really like I really like that story, particularly for that reason. That's why I clung to it and I, I listened to it over and over and over because I think that that's a massive lesson. Like it's just that's something that we all need to be aware of. Now, moving on to the elected officials, you know, I think I have an internal struggle with this. I think I've spoken with Ben about this too. But I know you say elected officials can't do it all alone, and you're right, they can't. But there are some elected officials that are strong enough of character and strength of will that they can actually resist being in a tide of garbage. You know, there, there are people that are Bill Rock pointing in the right direction, and a tide is flowing in the completely opposite of way. They will be eroded eventually over time, but they are there, and we have to make sure we reach out and support those people. In your book, you, you spoke about the vast difference on foreign policy between Carter and Reagan. Could you kind of expand on that a little bit? Well, yeah, it, it's... Um yeah, I'm not, not quite sure where you want to go with that, but I mean, uh, there's obviously a huge difference in that Reagan was a very conservative uh, Republican who went after communism and tried to basically pin communism on everybody he didn't like, like uh, Torrijos of, of, of Panama and Roldos of Ecuador, who both were assassinated very shortly after Reagan came into power. Uh, Reagan had this very, very dark, conservative, a view of the world, and he, anybody he didn't like, he'd label as a communist, and we'd go after him. But Carter was a very, very different person, personality-wise, and the, and the Democratic platform was quite different at the time. But another major difference was that Reagan actually had a lot of political clout. He had some political savvy, or at least he had people working for him with that, and, and Carter lacked that to a very large degree, so was fairly ineffective at moving forward with his platforms. And I, I think, once again, we, we have to look at another aspect of that in that the Republicans and the people who voted Reagan into power really stood behind him. Uh, the Democrats really didn't get behind Carter. And we've seen something similar with Obama. That, that Obama's uh, campaigns back about eight years ago uh, often looked like religious rallies. I mean, it was just wild. They were crazy. They looked like rock concerts. They were rock concerts. You know, everybody got very, very excited. But once he became president, that kind of went away. We, we didn't. St we people who voted for 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 uh, Obama didn't really get behind him in, in in a big way. And I think there's a huge lesson here that we need to get behind the candidates once we elect them. We also need to re recognize that even when our candidate isn't elected, uh, there's a lot we can do to keep pushing our our agendas forward, the, the things we really really believe in, and that we the people are the ones with the power. We have to also understand, I think, that our elected officials are extremely vulnerable. If someone really stands up to the system, they're likely to be torn apart. As an example, and I talk about this in the books, John Kennedy, um, the, 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 first, the only president in my lifetime who hasn't been supported by big corporations, wasn't elected with big corporate money. His father basically financed his campaign. We've now got two candidates running who claim not to take money from corporations, Sanders and Trump. You know, how does it end? But they're both claiming this. The only one that's taking money from big corporations and admits it, at least, is, is Hillary. Um, but w if we look at Kennedy, everybody knew Kennedy was having affairs with lots of women. Uh, mm -hmm. And that, that was okay. Uh, they had to take him down with a, a gun. Now, when, when, uh, when uh, Clinton came along, he was politically assassinated with a sex scandal. He was impeached. And, you know, he didn't need a gun anymore. The, the, the morality of the country, the attitude of the country had changed so much that you could destroy a, 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 a person politically by a rumor, or in this case it was apparently a fact. 
and, and he lied about it, which was unfortunate. But I think everybody, every everyone out there, uh, has skeletons in their closet. And even if we could, uh, let's let's assume Sanders doesn't have any skeletons, and let's assume he gets elected and doesn't take any money from corporations. If the FBI wants to, they can plant skeletons in his closet. They have access to all of his emails, all of his phone messages. That, 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 you know, uh, whoever is in the position of power today, and it's not just the presidents, it's it's also our other elected officials and so are our corporate executives. They're in very, very vulnerable positions. They, yeah. can, be, they can be assassinated politically or uh, professionally without a gun, without physical injury. And we, we need to get that. We need to understand that. I, I want to double down on that because I remember John Edwards was very, very popular. And, you know, he was a very successful uh, attorney and he went after corporations and he stood on behalf of the people in certain cases, not in all cases. Obviously, we have a, you know, a right shifted pro corporate spectrum of political thought in America today, right? But. As far as that goes, he actually did make some waves, and what happened to him? A huge scandal came out, and he was politically assassinated, just like you just, just like you just uh, mentioned in this story. Well, but, there's a lot of examples of that, Nick. I mean, another one is is uh, John Dean. You remember the the scream? Well, oh, Howard, he, didn't, yeah. he didn't really scream. He was enthusiastic. That does, that's not usually considered bad. I think it was a setup. Frankly, I, I mean, this is just a supposition, but. I think that the powers that behind the election didn't didn't want him in there, and they had they had something on him, and the scream was a way for him to bow out without being exposed for whatever they they had on him. We also saw the head of the IMF, Strauss Kahn, who was quite possibly going to be the next president of France, and was looking at really attacking the European Central Banking System. You saw him taken out by a sex scandal. Now, in that case, and in so many of these cases, John Dean and, and so many others, there's something. There's a real story. There's a real story behind the story. Sex, uh, uh, sex. Uh, um, Strauss Kahn was undoubtedly a sex addict. But you see, the system knows that. Those who want to take him out know that. You send a you send a a, a chambermaid who you've hired to seduce him into his room, and he's easily seduced anyway. He doesn't take very much, probably. But then, if you recall, uh, Strauss Kahn, you know, he, so he succumbed to this weakness that they knew he had anyway. He did something inappropriate, something wrong. He'd been doing a lot of wrong things, apparently. But they, they waited till he got on an airplane at, 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 in, in an airport in New York. I think it was JFK. And then sent in the police to take him off the plane in handcuffs with all the cameras rolling. The media knew this was going to happen. And that was not necessary. That, that was a huge show. That destroyed the man politically. And you know, it was a setup. I have no no doubt about it. And I'm and I'm also have no doubt that he was a sex addict. I'm not trying to defend his his you know his actions toward toward women, but I am saying that they know. <laughs> if you got a weakness, man, watch out, guard that weakness because it's going to come back to haunt you if yeah. you're in a position of power. Let me take a second and ask. There are some interesting comments here in uh, YouTube and I want to ask uh, just the first thing is one of them says what I took from this is that it's an explanation for who got us to sign those trade agreements and why the world is flush with new ones and they're trying to get nations to sign on to those yeah. I think what, what okay go ahead if you understand the question I was gonna rephrase it maybe well the trade agreements um yeah, I mean, obviously, the, 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 the trade agreements are totally pro big corporations. They're, they're putting big corporations in much more powerful positions. They're actually, as I understand it, and I read the leak, some of the leaked documents, um, it gives trade agreements sovereignty over countries. And that's ridiculous. You know, and first of all, it's, it's always been highly, highly suspect when huge trade agreements like TTIP and TPP are negotiated in secret. You know, wh why doesn't the American public have a right to know? Big, big corporations were involved in the negotiations, but you and I weren't. Consumer groups weren't. Uh, and that makes it very suspect. Those trade agreements, we also know, are, are based on the foundations of CAFTA and NAFTA, the Central American and North American free trade agreements that impact Mexico and all of Central America. And we've seen disastrous 
consequences of both NAFTA and CAFTA. Just one example, if, if, if you're looking for an easy explanation of what's wrong with these trade agreements, just one of many examples. Let's say that a, a big agri-industry can produce a unit of corn for $5 here in the United States, a unit of corn. And it costs, and, and, but that same unit of corn can be produced by a peasant farmer in, in Central America for $3. However, the, the big agribusiness in the United States gets a $3 subsidy from the U.S. government. That means the agribusiness can sell that unit of corn in Central America for something somewhat above $2, let's say $2.5, whereas the local farmer has to sell it for more than $3. And that's exactly what's happened. The local farm has gone out of business. The Central American company, countries cannot afford to give subsidies to their farmers. But because of the trade agreements, they also can't erect any kind of barriers like tariffs or taxes to bring that, that price up to a fair level to compensate for the, the, the subsidies that, that are paid in the United States. So these farmers go out of business. That's a large part of what we call the immigration problem here. Nick, you're in Texas. You're familiar with that problem. We're all familiar with that problem. You know, uh, Trump wants to build a wall. Well, that's not the solution. The solution is help the small farmer in Central America because we've destroyed the small farmer. They can no longer make a living off farming. They're swarming to the United States uh, to, to try to get jobs here. And in the process, their land now in Central America has been basically abandoned. The big industries, the big agro industries have now gone to Central America. They've taken over these lands uh, legally, and, and they're they're growing uh, flowers and broccoli, things that are not consumed in Central America, but are re-exported back to the United States for huge profits. And it's created throughout Central America a desperate labor pool, so yeah. our our big corporations can go down and open sweatshops and hire workers at less than the living standard because people in Central America are, are desperate. They are either going to flood the United States, and that's a very, very dangerous route to take and very unstable, or they go to work for some big uh, sweatshop at sub-living standard money, but at least it's something. And that's what the trade agreements have done. That and a lot more. That's just one of many examples. And if, we, if, T, if TTIP and TPP go forward, we're going to see that happen on a much, much larger level. What do you say to the critics that talk about how trade is good and it, it creates economies of scale and it improves efficiency? You know, the usual garbage that you hear, you know, economists get up there and they talk about trade in this, you know, fairy tale like way. But when you bring up the empirical data, they just kind of seem like that empirical data is just, you know, almost like a nuisance, like it doesn't mean anything. What would you say about that? Well, I, I totally agree that trade's a great thing, and, and I think free trade, uh, true free trade, we ought to have true free trade agreements, which would mean that, uh, that, that the, the big farmer here in the United States couldn't sell his farm in, in Central America. He'd have to charge more than $5 a unit, and the Central American farmer would be doing just fine there, and the, and the North American farmer could be selling, selling his product here if we want. But free trade would mean that you wouldn't have any of these. Not only would you not have the barriers, which these agreements usually tear down, the tariffs, et cetera, but you also wouldn't, countries like the United States wouldn't be allowed to have subsidies. That's not looked at as, as contrary to free trade, but it should be. So total real free trade where the playing field really is level is undoubtedly a good thing, uh, but in my opinion it is. But that's not what these agreements are. These agreements are totally skewed in favor of big corporations. And, and T, T, TTIP and TPP, in fact, make, make a situation where if a big corporation is in any country in the world, let's say a European country under, under these new uh, potential agreements, and uh, the country passes a law that, res that, that, that restricts the, the corporation's ability to make profits because it sets in place environmental laws to protect the environment of those countries or social regulations to protect workers' rights in those countries, the corporation can sue the country for implementing laws to protect its environment and its people. Uh, that's, uh, that's ridiculous, and that doesn't serve the interests of anyone anywhere in the world except the people who own the majority stock in that big corporation it looks as though they benefit, they make money off it. But since it's creating a much more unstable world and destroying resources, 
tearing down an economy, participating in the death economy, it ultimately is not helping the rich people either because we all live on this tiny, fragile space station that's got no shuttles. And even the rich people can't get off either. And we're headed for a disaster. If we, if, we, if we hit disaster, if we don't change the course, which I, which I know we can do, but if we, didn't, if we don't change the course, everybody's going to crash, including the very rich. Okay, another question from our from our YouTube channel. But before I ask this question, let me take a second to announce to everybody that just joined us. We are with John Perkins, the author of the New Confessions of the of an Economic Hitman, and this you're basically plugged into the Benjamin Dixon Show. This is Nick. I'm hosting uh, an interview with John Perkins here. Ben will be on tonight at nine. Now, we'll be ending a little bit early, but Ben will be on promptly on time at nine o'clock. But the question from the YouTube channel was, what is the, the interplay between government and corporations that really make this so devastating? You, you said the government kind of stands behind the, the, the uh, I guess, the corporate empire, so to speak. Well, yeah, that's, a, you know, that's an essential question, and it's a, it's a long one, and I go into great detail in the new Confessions of an Economic Hitman. So I'd, any interested reader, take a good look at, at the tremendous interlocking system of government and corporations. And what we just talked about, and, and so the, there's a lot in the book about that, many chapters, including the new economic hitmen that work for the big corporations here in the United States, the jackals that are, that are you know, using violence or threatened violence and all kinds of manner of spying techniques on us, drones and everything else that we know about in the United States today, in Europe. There's a lot in the book about that. Uh, but, you know, to kind of give a short version, what we just talked about with the trade agreements is a good example, that, that our government is supporting these trade agreements that are totally skewed toward big corporations. Uh, and I think we, we have to recognize that this revolving door policy uh, is, a, is a highway to corruption. So when we have people that can run a big oil company, for, for example, and then go to Washington to be in charge of the, of the body that oversees oil corporations, writes the rules for oil corporations, and then go back to work for oil corporations after two or three years in government, you know, that's, that's corruption. That just, that just sets the stage for corruption, uh, this whole revolving door thing. And, you know, we have to recognize that our politicians, so many of them, uh, when they leave office, if they lose their next election or they decide not to run, they're going to get incredibly lucrative jobs as lobbyists or consultants for corporations, and they know that while they're in the office. So they, they tend to serve those corporations. It's, it's, it's human nature, you know. It's, it's, just, it's, 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 a, it's a very hard thing to fight against except by changing the laws, to, for example, to make sure that when somebody leaves public office, they cannot go to work in an industry that they've been regulating or overseeing for at least five years. Hmm. You know, let me let me ask you this. Recently, the 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 actual line that people have used to say that that isn't corruption is they say you can't actually prove any kind of quid pro pro. They say stuff like uh, you can't you can't say that the money that they get in campaign contributions actually influences them because there's no evidence or you can't read inside somebody's mind or you know you didn't catch them at a diner exchanging briefcases of money so you can't prove corruption. What would you say to that? True, can't prove it probably, uh, and it's really it's legal so it actually isn't corruption. These corporations aren't doing anything illegal by offering people jobs. But let's say, Nick, that, you know, I come to you and I say, hey, Nick, you know, like, hey, I really want to support you. You've got this project that you're working on. You're, you're trying to develop something someplace, and I'm going to give you a couple of million dollars to help you develop it. And you've got this great radio show that you're doing, and I want you to promote me on that radio show. You can make me look good. And, and incidentally, if, if your radio show fails or you decide to get off there, I'm going to give you a job as a consultant at, at $500,000 a year to work for me. Uh, you know, just, you know, put me on your show once every month or so or, or put someone on that makes me look good. And I'm not asking you to do anything illegal. I'm just asking you, you know, I've got some people out there that are, that are dissing me. Uh, promote my book a little bit. Make me look good. You know, what are you going to do, Nick, probably? I mean, you know, and it may be that you actually believe in my book anyway and so you're not really doing anything that lacks integrity, but... but 
it's a very, very questionable. I, I, I go into detail on some specific examples in the book, and one of them I would mention is Senator uh, Dodd of, of, of uh, Connecticut. Now, I liked Senator Dodd. I'm from New England. I'm from New Hampshire. I thought he was a cool guy. He was in the Senate for about 20 years. But I later found out that as he was head of the finance, Senate Finance Committee, and uh, while he was in that position, he also ran for president and accepted huge amounts of money from the finance industry. He was head of the Senate Banking Committee. He accepted huge amounts of money from financial services organizations. It wasn't illegal, but I would call that uh, very, very sketchy. <laughs> you know, if you're Senator Dodd and you're accepting all this money and, and, and the same people that are giving you the money are coming to you and saying, hey, you know, like, we don't really like this this law that's being suggested that, that restricts the finance industry, uh, and, you're, and you're accepting this money from these people, it's going to be pretty damn hard for you not to listen to them very carefully, whereas you might not even open the door to someone who represented the other side. I, th I think I think that is an interesting point. Like uh, what you said was, it was it's not illegal, and I think at a certain point we have to realize that it's not so much what they're doing is illegal. We're not trying to send them to prison. We're not trying to prove something beyond, you know, whatever the burden of proof is to actually, you know, for a criminal act to send somebody to prison, right? This is the court of public opinion, and that is totally separate from the legal word corruption. Well, so, think, yeah, and I also think we should change the rules. I think someone who is head of the Senate uh, Banking Committee should not be able, I think it should be illegal for him to accept uh, money from, from the banking industry, from the financial services group. Well, of course, if we, if we had the, uh, you know, the, the movement to amend, if we actually reform the Constitution to get big business and big money out of the elect electoral process, that would, so that would solve that problem anyway. And that would be a big step. And of course, there's a huge movement in this country now to make that happen, which I totally support. Uh, that, would have a, that would have a big impact on the very things that we're talking about. It should be illegal for people to accept money when they're in a position to have control over those industries. It's not illegal now, but it should be. Okay, and 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 the point I would just want to add on to that is is I agree with you 100%. The rules should be changed, but when we're judging politicians, we shouldn't be concerned only with the legal legality because we know that the the legal system in this instance is not proper. It's actually not working well. Right? How are we going to judge them with the legal system when we know it's not equipped to deal with the situation? But right. yet we're still using that like it's some sort of acceptable metric. But right. I, I really do 100% agree with them. You said two of your clients were assassinated. Why don't you talk about your personal interaction with these individuals, Jaime Roldos and um, Torrejos? Yeah, Roldos was the first democratically elected president of Ecuador after quite a few years of brutal military dictators who I'd worked with as an economic hitman and were very much supported by the U.S., by the World Bank, by my organization, and, uh, and by our CIA. By the, I mean, these guys were protected. And then they, one of them came along, a, a, an admiral, and decided that the country ought to have democratic elections. Roldos ran on a platform that said that the oil companies ought to, if they came into his country in big time, which they were doing, especially Texaco, uh, should be very careful to protect the Amazon rainforest where they were drilling, and also should make sure that the Ecuadorian people got a fair share of the profits made from Ecuadorian oil. Uh, and both Torrijos and Roldos strongly opposed Operation Condor, which was a CIA operation that supported right-wing dictators in Brazil, Argentina, and Chile, because at the time, it was the height of the Cold War, uh, and uh, it was assumed by Washington that the Cuba was trying to take over the continent and turn it all communist, which seems a little absurd today when we think about Cuba. But anyway, that's, that's, that was the belief. Roldos and, and Torrijos were strongly opposed to Operation Condor and also with these other things. I was sent down. I spent a lot of time with both of them to try to convince them to change their ways, to go along with our system. They didn't. Uh, Roldos died when his plane crashed in circumstances that most people believe was, was not an accident. Uh, Torrijos at that time said, my friend Jaime was killed by the CIA and I'll probably be next. Less than three months later, he also was killed when his plane uh, crashed under very uh, suspicious circumstances, very much like Roldosa's. 
Uh, there's no question in my mind, and most people that have really been close to the situation, that those were both assassinations. In fact, I was just giving a TEDx talk in Michigan last week, and one of the other speakers was a former uh, Marine, uh, Major General in the Marine Corps, who was another speaker, and had been in Panama at the time. And uh, I asked him, I said, so what do you think happened to Torrijos? And he said, oh, he was assassinated. And I said, well, General, are you sure? And he said, he said nothing's 100 percent, but I'd say 98 percent certain, yes. And I said, who do you think did it? And he said, well, I think Noriega, who replaced Torrijos, did it. And I said, well, but wasn't Noriega a CIA asset? And he said, well, yeah, he was at times. Uh, we don't know exactly who was behind those murders, but we, we, I don't think there's, there's almost no question by anybody who was, who was knowledgeable in this that they were both assassinated. Now, I remember when you talked about our elected officials being vulnerable, and this is in our country, in the United States. They're vulnerable to, to influence and assassination you know, via publicity or in the public eye, but these people were assassinated overseas, right? So you see these politicians be assassinated. That's the stick. So they come to you as a, with the EHM, and you have the carrot. You have, you know, whatever special deal you're going to offer them or whatever they want or whatever their vices may be, that's their carrot. And if they refuse and they stand on principle, there's the stick. So when a, when a system operates like that, how many individuals would really stand up and, and be willing to go alone and, and be out there and be crushed? It's a critical question. People often ask me, didn't I have a difficult job convincing these presidents to basically uh, exploit their own countries and their own people? And the answer is no. In most cases, I didn't. I'm offering them these huge loans, which are going to make them and their families wealthy. We, 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 there's all kinds of systems set up so that they get money back, usually legally. I can get into that more detail if you want. But uh, And at the same time, I'm reminding them that, and, and incidentally, this, the CIA's own website and recently declassified documents uh, admit that the agency participated in the overthrow or assassination of, of uh, Prime Minister Mossadegh of Iran, uh, President Arbenz of Guatemala, uh, and Diem of Vietnam, and Lumumba of the Congo, perhaps best known of all is, is President Allende of Chile, oh, who, was yeah. replaced, who was replaced by a brutal dictator who was a huge supporter of Operation Condor, oversaw the murder of tens of thousands of his people, and was praised by Secretary of State Henry Kissinger as a great supporter of capitalism. Our countries admit it to participating in the overthrow and or assassination of, of these presidents. I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I don't believe in some overarching con conspiracy to take over the world. But there's no question that there's been conspiracies. And our government admits to them. We've admitted to a lot of them. And of course, our government is actually the biggest conspiracy theorist out there. They're constantly telling us that this, somebody's after us, ISIS, or somebody's conspiring to do something here. Uh, and I think we really need to face these facts, that, that our government does do these things. I don't like it, uh, and I want to stand up against it. So it's, it's not part of democracy, and I believe that democracy requires transparency. It, it demands that we, that we question our government officials, that we, we ask them, is this really helping us create a better world? Is this really helping us uh, present an image to the world of, of a country that, that believes in democracy and capitalism? No, it isn't. It's doing the opposite. I want to see that change. You know, you talked about you talked about a Chile, and was Allende before Pinochet? Is Pinochet who you're talking about, the brutal dictator in Chile? Yes, yes General okay. Pinochet. Yeah. So Pinochet comes into Chile, and he implements like a, a very, very, very harsh economic plan and the brainchild for all of this was Milton Friedman and his uh, Chicago boys right so they send those guys down there and they perform an experiment and it completely destroys the country like it's 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 terrible 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 and it shows that it fails yet you said at the time that people were praising this man and praising all the things he was doing there all the way through when it was producing outwardly terrible results Right. But it was producing really good results for our corporations. So the, one of the main reasons that, that uh, Allende was overthrown and that Operation Condor was put into effect was because of corporations like ITT, which you may not have even heard of these days, but 
And that was a company that had huge power in the United States at the time, the big communications company. Harold Janine, who was their CEO, was on the cover of Time. He was very, very well known. It was a very powerful company. Anaconda Copper, which was a bigger U.S. corporation that was taking copper out of Chile. There were many other companies like that. And throughout the hemisphere, there were a lot of um, uh, oil companies and other big companies that wanted to see policies put into place that supported huge corporations at the expense of local companies and local people. And so that was the justification for, well, that was, that was the reason behind a lot of this. The justification was communism, that these people were accused, again, they were accused of being a communist. He was a socialist, but he wasn't a communist. Torrijos and Roldos, who I knew personally well, didn't like communism. They didn't like the Soviet Union. They were, they, they tended to be socialistic. They had, so, they wanted socialistic policies. They wanted their people to get a fair share of the profits from, from these extraction companies. They wanted to have better education systems, better health care systems, but they were not communist by any means. And there's really, as we look back, there's really no evidence that Cuba was really trying to spread communism. Yes, Castro was talking a lot about such things and promoting a philosophy that was really more socialistic than communist. But he was supported by Russia. And so that opened the door for us to, as the United States, that is to say, uh, to, to go after these people as, as communists. We, we were terribly fearful at the time of the, the, the Red Scare, you know, that was going on. It was the Vietnam War was just beginning to heat up at that time, and we were terrified of communism around the world. The Soviet Union was very scary to us. Yeah, I, I mean, I was, of course I wasn't alive during that time, but when you, when, you, when you look back at that stuff, it does seem like it was more sensationalism than an actual belief by people in, the, in administration. Do you, do you disagree? Do, they, do you believe that that was actually a belief, or was it just propaganda to justify all sorts of nonsense? Well, I can only speak for myself in that regard, uh -huh. and, and I was fearful. My, my, my dad was, he was a Republican. He was fearful, but there was good reason to a certain degree. I mean, Stalin was a terrible person. You know, he was... He was a Hitler-type person. He did terrible things. The Soviet Union was a scary country, and it had nuclear weapons. And Khrushchev was a pretty scary person at many times. Uh, so there was, there was real uh, cause for fear, I think, uh, there, and in, in terms of the Soviet Union. I don't think we really had that cause for fear in, in Latin America. And I went down in the Peace Corps in the, the mid, in the late 60s, 68. Uh, Allende wasn't uh, overthrown and, and died uh, until a few years after that. I was down there at the time. I was there right very shortly after Che Guevara was uh, assassinated, was killed in, in Bolivia. I actually met the CIA agent uh, uh, who killed him, who was in charge of killing him, who ordered him killed, and, then, and, and, and actually ended up writing about it, Felix Rodriguez. Um, I didn't think that communism was a threat to Latin America in any way. Most Latin Americans that I knew just they much preferred the United States and the Soviet Union. <laughs> they weren't they weren't interested in becoming a Soviet puppet, but they also weren't interested in becoming a US puppet. And and they were, there was a lot of independence minded things going on there. And throughout Latin America there was a strong antithesis to what was going on in Vietnam. People thought I kept hearing how much People resented the fact that the United States was involving itself in a Southeast Asian country. They didn't fall for our line of, of the domino effect. And so they were generally nervous in Latin America that the United States was trying to do something similar in Latin America. And in fact, we were. We were putting in for place these right-wing dictators who were very, very strong advocates of American corporations, supported our oil companies, supported our copper extraction companies, supported our, our telecommunications companies and some of the big department stores and so on and so forth and the big agribusinesses that were going in and taking out bananas and pineapples and uh, shrimp and all kinds of other things. And Latin Americans were, were very leery about this. I'm going to tie two things together here. Like I remember I read something a long time ago where Jefferson said that to have one generation basically in debt another generation was an abomination yet in the Latin America we have dictators installed by the US signing agreements or putting in place policies that allow 
you know, signing agreements for loans and things that indebt the nation for, you know, years and years and years and years to come. And and you see, like, there's an entire continent, basically. South America was, was basically under this boot of, of debt peonage to the United States. Can you, can you kind of talk about, like, um, how they get trapped in it and why it's such a big deal and what the sweetheart deals that the corporations get out of it actually, you know, what they actually are? Yeah. Uh, and, and I go into a lot of detail in the new Confessions of an Economic Hit Man, Nick. Uh, but one example, let's go back to Ecuador. So Ecuador is ruled by this military junta. junta. And I go down there in the 70s as an economic hit man, and, and other people do too, and, and convince this junta to take out huge loans from the World Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank, build big electrical systems, hydroelectric projects. It, it, it destroyed some rivers, destroyed some indigenous lands, and so on, but uh, provided electricity to the big industries there. Uh, and we knew that the military dictators were going to make huge amounts of money off these projects because they had brothers or friends that owned subcontractors, pipe layers, and people like that, that we would pay top dollar to our construction companies. We'd pay top dollar. They wouldn't ask for discounts. They'd pay top dollar. Uh, people, members of their families who had John Deere franchises or Coca-Cola franchises, and we bought a lot of Coke and paid prime pop price. And we also offered scholarships to the children. Uh, we'd, we'd set them up to go to college in the United States, give them huge scholarships. So there were all these kind of legal bribes that went on with the military junta. They took out these huge loans. Now, about eight years ago, the democratically elected president of, of Ecuador, uh, uh, Rafael Correa took office. Correa yes. has a P PhD in economics from the University of Illinois. He understands the system. One of the first things he did was to renegotiate the oil contracts to make them more favorable to his country. Second, one of, the, one of the other first things he did was to appoint a commission to look at debt, the very debt that I had helped impose. The commission decided that $3.7 billion worth of foreign debt was not owed by the people of Ecuador because it had been taken on by these military dictators. And they they gained from it, but the people of Ecuador hadn't gained very much, and so Correa refused to pay the money. Um, and as a result, he was downgraded by Moody's, the, the World Bank, the IMF came after him. China gave him a billion dollar bridge loan, made it easy for him to start repaying it. His credit rating went back up, and now he's taken a hell of a lot of credit from the from China. Uh, and, and I'll say that, and, and Correa, incidentally, you know, endorsed one of my books. He says, yeah, this economic hit man book, this is, that tells what's happened here. Uh, and and he's he's done some things since then. He's been compromised to a large degree. That's, a, that's another whole story. But the fact of the matter is, this debt was taken on, and I was aware of in the 70s, by these military dictators who used it primarily for the, their own personal gain and the gain of their cronies. And the guy who stood up and refused to pay it later was sort of was dissed by our financial community, and now has turned to China. And we're seeing this over and over. And I think that's a shame because I, you know, I, I hate to see China make these huge inroads. But on the other hand, so many of these leaders around the world now look very skeptically upon the, the United States and our foreign policy, and and they'll say to me, "Yeah, China may end up doing the same thing," but they haven't. The United okay. States, the United States, and your banks. You've proven that you will do, that you can do this, and you will do it. All right. Thank you very much, John, for for joining us today. It, it seems that we're out of time, but I really would like to explore that more some other time. Maybe we can catch you when you have some time to speak with us again. I'd love to, and I wish we'd get into more about what we all can do because I'm very very encouraged that everybody can can turn this thing around. So I, you know, go to my website. Find the time for us. I definitely will have another session where we can get into that. But if you can have everybody. Be able to reach you by your website. Can you mention that real quick? Yeah, johnperkins.org. Buy the book. It's got all the details in it. Lists of things everybody can do. Go to my website. Sign up for my newsletter. You got to actually put your email in there. Johnperkins.org. Thank you very much. Thank you, Annette. Keep up your good work. Bye bye. Bye.